Hello, everyone. This is another episode of uh, Unisoft Law YouTube interview show. Please don't forget to subscribe and like. I uh, am really honored to have this guest today. His name is Colin Lachance. And I will just say that he is the founding CEO of Canly. Oh, but that's, that's not right. That's, that's not right. That's okay, right. so he is, he is the first CEO of Canly? <laughs> the first full-time CEO of Canly. The first full-time CEO. Okay, so pretty much he was at the roots of Canly, pretty much, right? So uh, we'll, we'll talk we'll, about we'll, that. We'll, We'll cover the truth on that, yes. We'll cover the So there are a lot of rumors, but the <laughs> truth will come out today. And uh, we will talk about the origins of Canley. We will talk about this, probably the most important legal innovation project in Canada, Canley. And everybody loves Canley. I don't know anyone who doesn't love Canley. And this man who is here today with us was at uh, the, or, almost at the origin point. We'll talk about that. And he is also going to tell us about his new project uh, that uh, has the potential to be as big. And I have lots of questions about it. So without further ado, Colin Lachance, hello. Uh, hey, Paul, thank you very much for uh, having me. It's fun to be here. I've been enjoying your episodes. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I want to just go back. You know, you're a really... An interesting person today and uh, you have been a really interesting person for uh, as far as I remember for at least a decade now but uh, I want to know where it all started so I looked at your LinkedIn profile and I noticed that you went to university in Manitoba but you live in Ottawa I associated you I associate you with Ottawa are you originally from Ottawa or from some, somewhere else uh, originally from Manitoba, grew up in Winnipeg. Go Jets. All right. Okay. So you're from Manitoba. And then you went for uh, your law school to University of Alberta? That's right. Okay. And uh, did you spend any time out there or did you leave the prairies, if I can put it this way? I don't know if Alberta counts as the prairies. Yeah, it counts as the prairies. Okay. Did you leave the prairies right after your education? Uh, no, no. So uh, we were nine years in Edmonton. So the, the first five years of my legal career were in Edmonton. I uh, grew up in Winnipeg, did a business degree there. And when applying to law schools, I, uh, I, I grew up living near the University of Manitoba. I had done summer camps there and so on. I did my business degree there. I knew every building inside and out. I had taken classes in the law school building there. So it was a desire to go somewhere else for my, uh, for my education that led me to the University of Alberta. That and the fact that the other schools I applied at rejected me. Uh, you know, you're not the first person on the show who explained their choice of school by their desire to leave <laughs> <laughs> home, I, I assume, that, right? And right. I know quite a few people like that. So you, you did spend a few years uh, in the prairies working as a lawyer, right? That's right. Yeah, I, I articled at a 20 lawyer firm, a sort of general activity firm. I, I did uh, everything from a, a little bit of criminal, uh, family, uh, employment, some tax, child welfare, uh, uh, a lot of stuff uh, uh, while I was there and finished my articling on a Friday. And the following Monday, I was uh, working for TELUS as a uh, public policy lawyer in its regulatory affairs department. So you went in-house? Yes. And how many years did you spend in-house with telecommunications companies? Uh, a lot. <laughs> so, so from uh, 1998 up until uh, I started with Canley in 2011, I, I was mm -hmm. in various uh, capacities in-house. Um, so it was five years in Edmonton with TELUS, uh, moved with TELUS to Ottawa as it was expanding its uh, public policy and regulatory affairs uh, department in the, in the city where the decisions were made uh, around federally regulated telecommunications. Uh, after a year there, I moved uh, into a, a, a lobby group of cable companies 
So in, in the early 2000s, uh, cable companies were getting into the telecom business. So I moved over as director of telecom regulatory affairs for the Canadian uh, Telecommunications, uh, or Canadian Cable Telecommunications Association. So a lobby group of the big players like Rogers and Shaw and so on. And uh, from there, uh, after a, a couple of years, they, or a year and a half or so, they shut down when Shaw uh, left uh, as a member. And then the next day, Shaw rang my phone and said, you want to come do our telecom regulatory work? But then the things got a little weird after that. Um, Telus called me back and said, instead of coming back as a lawyer, we, we want you back as a marketing director. Because as, as an in-house lawyer, I always prioritize figuring out how to do it. Whatever it was, whatever we were trying to accomplish, I wanted to figure out how to do it. And telecom being a heavily regulated area, particularly on the wholesale side, uh, the wholesale uh, marketing vice president said, well, you understand our business, you understand telecom, whatever gaps you have in marketing, we'll make sure you earn it <laughs> on the job. And so while uh, for that three year stretch, I wasn't acting as in-house counsel. I, I maintained uh, uh, active status and I, I would occasionally do work that would dip into uh, both the regulatory and the legal side. Like one example was uh, we were devising a strategy uh, to uh, create a, a, a new structure for some large contracts with some of our larger um, wholesale clients. And these are contracts in the tens of millions and hundreds of millions. Um, and the strategy encompassed, well, what is the corresponding regulatory strategy and what is the corresponding legal strategy? So one deal in particular, I, I helped work on the, the regulatory strategy, devised the business strategy. And when it came time to sign, to draft the contracts, legal said, here, Colin, you do the first draft. <laughs> then they did, they did the work after that. And then after that, I, I moved into um, uh, lobbying as a, as a, as a, uh, a director of federal government affairs. So it's, it's a weird thing where uh, being a lawyer, then being a marketer sort of combines together to say you're a lobbyist because now you're being persuasive with PowerPoint instead of with uh, briefs. Mm -hmm. Well, that time when, when you worked in-house, I think it was when the internet really exploded. Yeah. And uh, specifically late 90s was the beginning of it all. And then it just started growing exponentially and all of these uh, startups started uh, popping up like Google or Facebook. And during all of that time, you were in-house with telecom with telecom companies. And I understand you were exposed to legal advice as a lawyer. You were exposed to marketing, business strategy. What kind of exposure to technology did you have in, uh, in these I've positions? My, yeah, I've described my career as always being at arm's length from an engineer. Mm -hmm. So both within the teams I, I, I'd work in, because right from the beginning, so 1998, uh, while hired as a lawyer, I was hired into a multidisciplinary team. My, my colleagues weren't exclusively lawyers. They were MBAs, they were engineers, uh, and, and uh, then they were you know, people coming from other disciplines. And so uh, it, the exposure to technology, either both at, a, at an infrastructure level as well as an, at an application level was constant throughout all mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. Is this what you said that your job interview when you uh, were considered for a Canley CEO position? That was an interesting thing um, because there was nothing in my resume up to that point that said this person should be the CEO of Canley. But uh, in making that application, it, it, so Canley put up this, this job post uh, in fall of, of 2010, so 10 years ago. Uh, I had just started doing a part-time uh, LLM uh, with concentration in law and technology. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I, I saw the post. It looked really interesting. And I, uh, because I, I was familiar with Canley, um, didn't use it a lot at that point, uh, but I, I was familiar with it and I liked the concept of it. But my exposure to, uh, again, internet technologies, uh, the being sort of near the dot-com boom and bust and everything that went through it, seeing the, uh, the evolution of platforms uh, as a service, that was already 
happening, the concept of APIs. Mm -hmm. Well, we didn't necessarily call them APIs. The, the group I was responsible for as a marketing director in, in TELUS essentially had database dips, which are basically APIs, like web services. We just didn't call them APIs. So seeing all those pieces together allowed me to uh, approach um, the job posting with a story to, to, to say, is, uh, I did upwards of like 70, 80 hours of research, even to, to create my first initial application to be considered by the headhunter to move forward. Uh, so I, I analyzed uh, uh, Canley's history, uh, Canley's uh, peer group, the uh, evolution of free access to law and digital access to law uh, in Canada and globally, the, the commercial peer group, and, and then again, seeing parallels in other industries, uh, telecom being one, but um, you know, most digital industries, anything involving transport and supply chains and so on being, uh, you know, others, uh, it, it allowed me to approach the, the, the hiring committee with a vision of who Canley was, what it intended to be from the people who created it a decade earlier. And this is where I say I wasn't there at the original. I, I, was, I think it's more accurate to say I was there at the inflection point. Uh, and so I, I came through with a vision uh, to say, here's everything that I've, I've, I've discovered, everything I've learned. Um, you know, here's all sorts of stuff about, uh, I, I remember looking at uh, uh, tools like, uh, like Alexa and Comscore and other things like, uh, like a decade ago to say like, here's, here's page views, here's where the, the traffic comes in and out, here's the utility, here's you know, the value and all that. And so as it turned out, the, the board had itself recently done some strategic planning and I, I arrived with a vision that was reasonably well aligned with where they were going. Um, and, and again, I just want to sort of be, be clear on the, on the part. Um, I, I don't want to take credit away from the people who actually created Canley. So the people who created Canley uh, are the Federation of Law Societies, Lexum, who was then a, a lab at the University of Montreal. And probably the, the hardest working person in all of this outside of those groups was Janine Miller, who was the librarian at the Great Library uh, at, at Osgoode Hall. She was the project director for Canley's first decade. So uh, while doing that, while working full-time for the Law Society, <laughs> uh, managing the library, she's the one um, who, with the others, helped push it forward. Where I had the opportunity to come in is about seven or eight years into Canley's growth, the the law societies, the owners of Canley, uh, began to reach the conclusion that they weren't the ones controlling it, that, that they had a representative board, uh, somebody who was, you know, a rep from Alberta, from Manitoba, from every law society. And they, that group was more or less agreeing with the recommendations of Lexham. And, and that's where the brains, the strategic planning was mostly coming from. Um, and so the, the law society said, uh, we need to create an independent skills-based board that has the expertise to oversee an organization like what Canley is and what Canley can become. And that board's first mandates have to be to hire a, a, a full-time CEO and devise Canley's first independent strategic plan. So when I came in uh, in 2011, that was already a decade into Canley's evolution. Uh, and that was the, the point of the mandate. So uh, you know, I, I, I take no credit for all the hard work and the vision that, that, that went in the establishment and the creation and building the foundation of Canley. Uh, I, I, I uh, feel incredibly you know, blessed that I had the opportunity to uh, work with such talented people in order to move it from a thing that was nice to have and was the foundation of something that could be great to something that is now by any measure indispensable to the Canadian legal market. So I'm grateful for the opportunity I had to be there at that time and contribute in that way. This is an incredible story. So Canley existed as early as 2000 or 2001. That's right. Correct. Correct. This is really early, especially by uh, the standards of our legal system, our legal profession. And uh, I mean, Google didn't exist then, right? Uh, Google's 98. 97, 98. But yeah, well, Facebook, Facebook didn't exist. Facebook didn't exist. Facebook right. for sure. Twitter didn't exist. I don't think. Uh, 
So you're, you're uh, right. I mean, the inspiration, like a lot of it comes down to uh, in 1993 at Cornell University, two professors, um, uh, Tom Bruce and Peter Martin, created the, the Legal Information Institute in the US. And they did it, they had to create a browser because in 1993, browsers didn't really exist <laughs> in order for that to be possible. Around the same time, Lexham, uh, Danielle Poulin at Lexham was publishing Supreme Court of Canada decisions on Gopher. Now you, you have to be old or really geeky to, under, to even know what Gopher is at, at this point. Uh, and so the, 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 the visionaries were there Australia, you know, created Austley, Graham, Graham Greenleaf, and, and uh, Andrew Mowbray and Philip Chung uh, in 1996. So by the time 1999 came around, um, what you had as the driving factor for those groups, like these innovators, was to say, look, we know what the commercial access thing is going to look like. We know how spotty the free access thing is. Um, the, the, something has to be done on a, on a larger scale. Uh, or else we're not going to like the way things are going to roll out. So, so yeah, it's it's really incredible to to look at the vision and the effort that was put in over 20 years ago. It's it, again, it's that whole idea of like the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, and thankfully for the rest of us now, somebody did. Right. Can you tell us? So I understand that Lexon was uh, one of the founders of Canley, correct? Yes. Uh, and then the foundation of law societies was the other one. Or was, yeah, the, was there anybody else? Law societies, yeah. Was there anybody else at the, at the origin point? Well, there's um, I mean, there's a big long list of, of of advisors and so on, but but effectively, that's those are those are the groups. So you had Lexum who had devised a, a technological method for um, collecting and publishing case law, and you had the law societies who uh, viewed it uh, started to become aware of the necessity, like that. There's, there's other threads to the story, right? Like it, um, anybody who does copyright law is familiar with the CCH case from 2004, uh, where a, a legal publisher sued uh, the Law Society of Upper Canada, as it was then known, for a photocopying service of, of cases. So uh, lawyers from outside of Toronto would say, I need a copy of this particular case. The Law Society would, the library would photocopy it and send it off. So there was a, it was a copyright claim. So that was one of the other drivers. So if you want to, if you want to give credit <laughs> again to sort of where the, where the impetus came from, and that was one of it too, because if you know, the law society is potentially facing this, this world where commercial providers were going to be able to lock down through copyright uh, uh, case law and the dissemination of case law. And, and so the law societies as regulators, as, as protectors of, of the professional competence of their members took it upon themselves to create um, uh, or to fund. Like the, the initial contribution 20 years ago was $500,000 uh, on a 16 month pilot project. And it started with 20,000 documents. Uh, and, and so that took a, a lot of guts um, for the law societies to try to, to do, to, to, to try and push that forward, a lot of vision. Yes, undoubtedly, but I, I wonder if there was one person who pitched this to the law societies. Yeah, was there yeah, such a Daniel Poulin. So but tell us a little bit about this visionary genius. <laughs> <laughs> so, so again, gl globally, if you look at um, what uh, Cornell has done, what Ostley has done, and what uh, Canley has done. You have these groups of, of, of people, Danielle uh, at, at University of, of Montreal, and um, a couple of his uh, colleagues who came on shortly thereafter who have been uh, you know, along for the ride and been a key part of it as well. But uh, Dan Danielle is really the one who um, brought the story forward and said, hey, look, here's what we're doing at University of Montreal. Here's what's happening. But the idea of, of law as a data source um, actually dates back, like you can look at the stories of the, the founding of, of uh, Quick Law, for example, and trace its origin back to the 60s. You can look at the, uh, the, the Center for uh, Re uh, Research in, in, in Public Law uh, out, of, uh, out of University of Montreal. And again, like programmatic access to law has been a research topic in Canada for over 50 years. 
So even, even people like Daniel relied on people who came decades before him for the inspiration, like Hugh Lawford, who founded Quick Law. Um, there's, all these kinds of things uh, sort of bubble along in the Canadian ecosystem. And, and one other person, again, who, while not part of the Canary story, I think is part of the same uh, Canadian legal innovation story that's worth mentioning is Eric Appleby. Eric Appleby uh, founded Maritime Law Book. And when we get into the like my other parts of my story in the compass, you'll know that you know I, I'm trying to carry his legacy forward with what we're doing right now. But in, in his case, uh, he did, he did a couple phenomenally innovative things. He started a law publisher in Fredericton, New Brunswick in the late 60s because print publishers weren't publishing New Brunswick case law. And he expanded that into a national business and at, at the high point had over 70 employees doing this. Um, Maritime Law Book was also the first uh, World Wide Web accessible legal research platform in, in Canada in 1997 www.mlb.nb.ca was where you would go to access their digital research tool. And in that year, Quick Law, you know, that's the year I graduated law school. Uh, and Quick Law was available and it was great, but it, it wasn't on the web. It was, you know, tunneled through like a, you know, a, a private data service. So there's a lot of like phenomenal innovation that's, that, um, that we're all building on top of. But yeah, on the on the Canley side, uh, without Daniel Poulin, it doesn't it doesn't exist. It, it it appears that Canley was originally uh, a service for distributing court decisions. Yes, it is much more than that today. Yes, and. Uh, I attribute a lot of that, of course, to your term. What are the top three things that were your biggest achievements uh, during your term as uh, Canley CEO? Yeah, so the things I'm most proud of uh, are uh, uh, creating that, that bigger push into secondary source material, uh, working with Lancaster House, putting the employment law text up in 2012. Um, the creation of Canley Connects as a, a vehicle to show both the, the users and creators of, of secondary legal source content that Canley was a place where it can come. So in 2014, Canley Connects went live with 27,000 case summaries and, and case digests and so on. Um, and uh, the other one, uh, which hasn't served um, in Can Canley's continuous growth, but again, I'm, I'm phenomenally proud of it, was the Canley API. Uh, the, the, the element that uh, would allow people to access Canley metadata uh, in order to begin to create their own services. So, you know, I started my job in, at the beginning of 2011. Uh, by the end of 2011, I had that, the creation of an API on the roadmap. Uh, by the end of 2012, I had the funding for it, and at beginning of 2013, it was uh, it was out and available. And, and then in 2013, we hosted. So it, in 2013, that means we had probably the first uh, globally the first API that covered the country's entire legal system. Um, and in 2013, we probably also hosted, and you were there, uh, the the first uh, legal technology hackathon in, in Canada. So that, that's something I'm, I'm immensely proud of and it, and, and it drives what I'm doing right now. The, 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 the motivation behind creating those elements drives what I'm doing with the Legal Innovation Data Institute. Yes, I definitely remember that road trip to Ottawa <laughs> for that hackathon, uh, you know, in the track suit I was wearing and uh, I, I, I brought my, um, uh, programming uh, buddy, my uh, engineer buddy, and uh, Ilya. we did some. I remember. Ilya. Oh wow, my God! There you go. <laughs> so, explain the concept of APIs to our viewers, and then apply that to uh, legal uh, document uh, domain. Sure. So the way I explained it to the law societies in 2011, 2012, was to say, pick up your phone and look at the weather app. Because even then we had a weather app. Said, you know, 
do you think that the person who made that app is the one going out and, and collecting all the temperature data? Like they're getting it from somewhere. This is, there are sources in, uh, that, that exist to gather, clean, organize, and, and uh, turn data into an input for other downstream applications. Sometimes those sources only apply it to their own creations. Other times those sources allow for access to it. Um, and that the access doesn't have to be in the form of here's a giant database, a giant spreadsheet. It's in the form of a periodic web service call to basically say, I need a piece of data, send it to me. And then the piece of data is sent back into the application that the requesting party has created. So the weather app on your phone, the reason you can have two or three or four different weather apps is because whoever's actually collecting the weather, whether it's you know Environment Canada or somebody else, makes that data available via an API so that it can be accessed and used in support of uh, integration as well as the creation of new services. So that's the way I've, I've, I've always explained it. Engineers might you know, say, no, that's not exactly right. But when you're explaining an API to somebody who you're asking for money in order to fund the API, that worked. <laughs> Now, apply that to legal document uh, to the legal document domain. Why is API important for a service like Canly? Well, uh, again, I, you know, it's less so about a service like Canly, but more about, about a service about what can other people do with legal data. Um, so uh, let's talk about Lexis for a minute. So, so Lexis uh, on Quicklaw has Microsoft Office for for Quicklaw. Um, uh, and that's been around for years. And, and that's something where when you're working on a Word document, you have the ability within your Word document to call elements of the Lexis database without using the Lexis or QuickLaw interface. So in legal, this is a, a way to access the intelligence that you need without switching the tasks uh, away. So that's at a user level. At, a, at, a, at an aggregate level, APIs are important for exposing uh, intelligence um, and, and other details to somebody in a way that is secure. So if I give you a, um, uh, an Excel spreadsheet that has a pile of data, you have access to it, you're making copies of it, you can um, you know, go off and do something. I've, I've effectively lost control uh, over it. Uh, but if I expose that same information to you, via API, you, you as a creator can get the same utility out of the data without me losing control over it. And if, if an element, and in legal, this is an important one, if, if an element of the source information behind the API changes, we don't all have to reprogram it. I don't have to give you a new Excel spreadsheet with, it, with a new copy of the data. I can just ensure that next time you call the API to request that data piece, it sends the updated information. So with, within legal, the ability to integrate services um, uh, with each other and with primary data sources, uh, I, I think it's incredibly dependent on, on APIs. So, so API allows other people, people other than Canly, to build applications or tools for end users on top of Canly's data. Is it a fair way to, to say that? Yes. That that was my uh, that was my intent in 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 pulling it together. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> as I understand it right now, the Canly API. Um, if you go to the Canly website, there's a reference to the API, and it will take you to a GitHub page, and and that's basically just the uh, let's just call it like a document page that explains what the API is. But there's no immediate process available to gain access to the key because right. the communication to access it. You, I, I don't know what Canada's current practice is for issuing keys to use the API is. I know their documentation is visible, but if mm -hmm. somebody approaches them and asks for a key, I don't know what their process is right now. So if I understand it correctly, a Canada's API is not commercially available right now. I cannot start a company to build an app on top of Canada today. I, I don't think, you know, in fairness, I don't think you ever could, even even in the version that that we had developed. What, what we had developed initially was something that allowed you to call lists of information to get deeper and deeper into the metadata. So 
metadata of a case includes things like um, who's, uh, what court is it, what's the date, what's the citation, what's the case title, who's the judge, you know, what are the parallel citations and so on. What's the link to it, that kind of metadata. Under the original API that we created, um, you would say, I, I, in order to get that level of data, you might have to first call to say, I need a case from the uh, Alberta Court of Appeal. So I need a list of all the cases. Now I found the case I want, I need this. And there was a separate API that could search to, to let you find it. Um, the, it. It's the kind of thing that could, I'd say, uh, improve whatever service that, that you've, you've built, but it was never, I think, in a position where you could independently build a business on top of it. Like, you know, people might remember in the earlier days of Twitter, um, you weren't just using the Twitter app or, or TweetDeck or something like that. You were using whatever particular Twitter client made the most sense for you. That was a, a form of API that allowed for building businesses on top of it. Mm -hmm. The Canada API, as, as we set it up and as it is right now, is about calling for pieces of information um, that can be used to augment and improve. Now, some people can, can create something quite effective out of that. And, and, and again, I don't, I, I don't want to speak for Canley. I, I left in 2015. I can just say my observations of the level of availability and the promotion of it right now suggests that it, Canley does not prioritize um, uh, use and adoption of its API. It, it exists, it hasn't removed it, but I, I'm not aware of it prioritizing it or promoting. Does Canley have to license its content from anyone? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I, I was asked that often when I when I was there, and uh, the Canley receives Canley and all legal publishers receive content from the courts either under arrangements that have been in place for decades uh, or under specific terms of agreement. In Canley's case, there have been some courts that have limited its uh, permissions to use that content only on its own website. So that suggests that Canary does not have the ability. Um, there's different views on that. I mentioned the CCH case, uh, which says that it's a uh, public domain, uh, that, that case law is public domain and that there's no um, copyright inherent in the body of a, of a case. But at the same time, Crown Copyright says uh, it, uh, the copyright in the case law you know, can go to the courts. I've had senior legal officials of courts say, no, the judges believe that they hold the copyright in their decisions and so on. So, so can we, whether can we can or can't is, is, a, is a question that I think everybody would like to resolve. Um, because can we has you know, the, the best collection, the best, most public collection. Um, Lexus and West probably have more data, but uh, they'll have the best, most public collection. So it would be good if Canley could. Canley's view is that it cannot. It's view that it's expressed recently in, in the past couple of years to parliamentary committees and in, um, in a, as an intervener at Supreme Court is that crown copyright is the barrier. I just want to put it to our viewers that if there was a freely available API over all court documents in Canada, we would have almost a magical explosion of innovation in the Canadian legal industry. And uh, we can certainly go into that and prove it formally to our viewers, but I will just have you agree to it. And the reason I'm asking uh, or putting this to the audience is because I want to uh, ask you about uh, Legal Innovation Data Institute. But before we go into that, do you think legislation can solve the problem of copyright uh, over court documents once and for all, and uh, perhaps finally enable open and free APIs over court, court documents? Yes. <laughs> and is this something, is this something, is the lobbying effort involved in uh, passing that legislation. Is this something that Legal Innovation Data Institute that you founded this year are going to do? Uh, yes, so there's two aspects to that. 
So there's, there's the legal environment and then there's the practical environment. So the legal environment, um, again, in a, in, a, in a Supreme Court case, I, I can't remember if it was Keatley or Knight. I think it was Keatley. I've forgotten already. Uh, but the Canadian Association of Law Libraries put forth the argument that crown copyright doesn't protect, it was, it was never intended to protect judgments uh, or legislation, so primary law, because um, it, it, it was only intended to protect, uh, protect documents created by the crown in its executive capacity, not the crown in its legislative capacity or in its judicial capacity. And so it tried to ask the court to speak to that, and the court did not. But both Canley and, and the law, uh, Canadian Association of Law Libraries have, through copyright lobbying efforts, tr tried over many years to make, these, to make this point. So yeah, if Section 12 of the Copyright Act changed to say, you know, there's no crown copyright associated with primary law, you know, which is the legal status of this in the, in the US based on like longstanding precedent uh, on, on statutes and regulations and judi sorry, on judicial opinions and a more recent Supreme Court decision in the US on, on you know, edicts of government and, and uh, run legislation. So that's the status in the US. Um, the practical limitation here is the, the, the parties that you know, we should be asking to make this broadly available are the courts, the, the creators of, of the content. The creators of the content should make it available in bulk in a way that it can be used more broadly by everybody. Because they aren't, and because lobbying and trying to convince you know, 47 or 60 different courts uh, to change their process, that's kind of futile. That sort of leaves us in the position of saying, well, if we can't fix the legislation and we can't make all the courts change, then we have to focus our attention on the people who already have access, the publishers. Like who's, who's already been put in a position to collect this data? And maybe they can do something with that. And that's why a lot of people, myself included, have suggested that Canley is probably in the best position to do it. Canley, under its current uh, strategic plan for 2020 to 2024, doesn't have this anywhere in its priorities. It's, it's really focused on building secondary, more broader secondary source material, which is laudable, but it doesn't have this as a priority. So uh, that, that sort of you know, leads us to say, well, how do we get there? And so what the, the Legal Innovation Data Institute is going to do is yes, it will participate in the lobbying efforts and legislation. It will um, work with um, participating courts to encourage them to make the data available in bulk and go further by providing the infrastructure to make that possible. So what we've already done is we've created the infrastructure to take the entirety of the Compass collection, which uh, I mentioned Maritime Law Book. Compass is, is the successor to Maritime Law Book, has all its historical stuff, has uh, MLB's seat at the table to receive all the new cases and publish it. Uh, and Compass currently publishes it through a company called VLEX. And I was associated with VLEX for, for a few years as part of the buildup of Compass. Um, but Compass is essentially said, we have a compilation of data. And, and again, copyright lawyers will correct me if I, if I you know, misstate this, but there's a difference between copyright in a compilation and copyright in an underlying document. And I can claim copyright over a compilation, even if I can't claim copyright over an individual document within that compilation. So Compass has licensed its compilation into the Legal Innovation Data Institute. And so that includes all the courts uh, outside of Quebec. Um, but the Legal Innovation Data Institute is gonna go to each of those individual courts and say, we would like to license or acquire your data directly into the same platform that we're using. So that way somebody doesn't have to rely on the license component. It'll just you know, come through as source. And so now what we're saying, this ties us back to our API conversation is we'll manage privacy considerations, we'll manage API considerations, we'll manage you know, uh, uh, access, um, bulk access rules and, and data usage agreements and all that. We'll manage all of that. And so that's the offer that the Legal, Inno Legal Innovation Data Institute is beginning now to put out to individual courts. Oh, we lost your volume.
I forgot to unmute myself. I apologize. Are you essentially building a clearinghouse for court data and a sort of a, a layer of abstraction to hide all of these uh, technical and legal details and the particulars of interacting with the courts so you can then provide this data to consumers of data such as Scanly or maybe a future uh, service? Yes, so um, we are creating that layer of abstraction and I would say not to hide the, 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 the technical and legal issues, but to manage the technical and legal issues. Um, so we, we, we call it a trust, a data trust. So we know within the data trust that we are stewards of the data. We're managing um, on the, the, the public interest in that data, as well as the public interest of parties that are mentioned in the data. So one of the reasons courts have been reluctant to make this available in bulk or to limit who gets access to bulk information is because of the privacy issues. They don't like the idea of uh, 100,000 decisions sort of being put up on, on Google uh, to be indexed because none of the publishers index the body of the decisions. Um, and, and so what we're saying is, you know, send it to us, we'll manage that, we'll ensure that that doesn't happen on the, on the downstream side. So that's an element that, that we wanna manage um, because this lets us get more information into more hands for more creation. Now, whether or not um, existing publishers become uh, members of the Institute uh, and users of the data through that flow, the door is open. It would be a great idea. Uh, I'd love to see it happen. And so I, 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 I wanna have those conversations with existing publishers as well. But in the meantime, what we're starting with is uh, members and organizations outside of the group. So that includes um, a company out of Alberta called Alta ML. They're like a, a hundred person company that didn't exist three years ago. Uh, now has a hundred people doing commercializing machine learning uh, services. Um, and so they're moving into legal data. And so they're a member, they're getting access to the data, they're working with it. Um, BG Communications, a, a, a translation firm that does uh, legal, uh, pharmaceutical and you know, high-end engineering and intellectual property translations um, wants to work with the data to enhance its ability to serve uh, the uh, you know, Canadian like a, a, a bilingual and bi-juridical uh, legal environment on, 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 on translation matters. Um, law school clinics, the, the legal data science lab uh, at the University of Ottawa under the Center for Law, Technology and Policy, uh, they have a lot of plans that they wanna do in legal data text mining on analysis of, of um, the substantive aspects of law to do better empirical research. Uh, the Conflicts Analytics Lab at Queens wants to build free access apps like in, in the manner of like a Blue Jay um, and they've already started doing that. So there's a lot of innovation that we're enabling right now, but in order for Canada to really level, like you said, like a massive explosion, we, we need to sort of move to a point where all of the data is, is accessible to as many people as possible for as many creative uses as possible. And so we, the, the idea in creating the Legal Innovation Data Institute is a, is a recognition that there's no player independently that's in a position to do that. So we created uh, the core to allow that to grow. I mentioned Canley started 20 years ago with $500,000 and 20,000 documents. So we're starting with less money, but 400,000 documents. <laughs> and we're starting with APIs. We're starting with um, you know, access to, to information. We're doing projects to make that even go faster and further. We're doing a project with a company called Private AI uh, to allow us to uh, create de-identification tools in case law. So we're not just hiding every name of Mary Smith. We're only hiding Mary Smith as party or witness, but not Mary Smith as judge. We're not hiding the name Mary Smith as counsel. We're not hiding like, these elements. So creating an, a, not just the layer of abstraction, but another layer of data that, that can be put into even more hands with less concern.
because we've, we've anonymized it uh, in an effective and, and public serving way. So these are the kinds of things that the Institute is pursuing. Amazing. How can lawyers, uh, members of the legal profession, help the Institute? Uh, several different ways. Um, membership is open to any organization that wants to use the data for internal uh, or non-commercial applications. So internal, uh, if you're a law firm and you want to um, uh, improve the, your internal knowledge management system by building internal apps that, that tie into other databases within your system that tie the primary law, your, member, your firm's membership in the organization advances all those public interest goals that we have. Um, if, if you're a lawyer and you want to uh, assist some of our, um, our nonprofit groups, we have people, uh, some of these groups, the for-profit, nonprofit, need guidance on what applications should they be focusing their efforts on. Um, other aspects, uh, if there's a startup that you think is just amazing and they, 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 they could be assisted by working with this data initially to build out a proof of concept, um, we've created a sponsor category that says instead of getting like a full membership, you can sponsor a project of a, of a worthy group to help them move forward. So there's a lot that lawyers can do, um, you know, from using it themselves, uh, assisting those who are using it by guiding on where the needs and priorities are, uh, and, 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 and sponsoring others who can be, uh, who, who, who know what they, want to, what they want to create, but they just need access to the data. Are you engaged with the judiciary and with provincial uh, ministries of attorney general? And if not, do you need any help with advancing that? Is, is that a priority? It, it is a priority. So where we are right now, as I mentioned, Compass has these relationships. Um, Compass uh, is licensing its data, you know, in, in particular terms. So, and, and because, you know, I'm on Compass side and I'm on Liddy side. Yeah, I've got I've got the relationships to advance it. Um, the other thing that we've done in the in the creation and in the advancement of this is, you know, I've I've had um, dozens and dozens of conversations with people with with course and with uh, different aspects of the ministries uh, across Canada, both people still in these roles as well as people who've retired out of them to really understand where the concerns are. And now that we're we're literally, you know, 15 days since we've launched. Um, we've got a, a, enough of a story out there publicly that we're packaging it and we're, we're beginning that outreach to, to talk to people to say, okay, now we'd like to add these federal tribunals to our collection. We'd like to add these provincial tribunals to our collection. Ministries of, of Attorney General, uh, provincial and federal, are good for the tribunals because they, they can, from a political perspective, say uh, direct... The, the, the tribunals to just send it over. Courts, you have to work your way up through the, through the, the hierarchy to get the permissions and so on. So mm -hmm. nobody's really in a position to lean on a court. <laughs> so we're, we'll, we'll, we'll take our time and, and, and work that through, uh, through a, sort of a, the, the back and forth that we've already begun of, of educating to give comfort that, that we're not sort of breaking any rules uh, or any norms. Um, but also to show how we can advance. And then uh, within our advisory group, we have people like uh, Meredith Brown, for example, who was, uh, uh, she was a uh, general counsel to several deputy attorneys general in the past. She was the executive director of the innovation office with the Ontario Ministry of Attorney General, well connected with these folks. So within our advisory group, we, we have people that can help us move these things forward. But any individual lawyer who has an idea, wants to get involved, love to hear from them too. Where can uh, people find out more about uh, Legal Innovation Data Institute? So lidi.ca, uh, you'll find uh, uh, who's involved, what our priorities are, what projects are already underway, um, different ways of getting involved, uh, all that information's there. Uh, we're adding in details of, you know, as we get mentions in uh, it, earlier this week, Canadian Bar Association had an article that included a discussion of us. Last week, it was a lot of times on uh, another launch, other, uh, other blogs in the US and the UK took note because the model that we've created uh, doesn't have a parallel. It takes inspiration from a, a lot of the free access to law groups, a lot of the innovators in the 
who were there in the 90s coming up with the, the ideas and stressing the importance of getting access to law. So we take a lot of inspiration from groups like that, from the Harvard Case Law Access Project and so on. We've got relationships with, with all these places, but the model itself is, is new. It, it doesn't exist like this. And so we're working within the unique constraints of, of the Canadian history and the Canadian legal and practical environment in order to, to sort of elbow our way to become bigger. Colin, I want to thank you for taking the time to meet with our viewers today. You know, I feel like I'm back in 2011 when uh, Canley was uh, growing quickly and when all of these ideas were floating, the APIs gave us all kinds of inspiration. I remember the hackathon very well. And I have this feeling again after talking to you about the Institute, I think this is going to be huge. I personally uh, am available if you need any help with anything. I'm really excited. Thank you so much, Colin. It was really great to have you today. Yeah, yeah Pilot, I appreciate the invitation and I hope you don't mind you know, how many rants I, I went off of. As you can tell, I'm, I'm pretty uh, passionate about this. I love rants. This show is all about uh, rants, so <laughs> great. Thank you so much.